Good morning, Facebook community. I'm Christina Mozafari for HIV.gov. Here in Montreal at the International AIDS Conference, where today I have the great pleasure of welcoming Dr. Carl Diefenbach. He's the director of the Division of AIDS for the National Institutes of Health. Doctor, welcome. It's a pleasure to be back with you today. It's a pleasure to have you here. You know, we spoke uh, a couple of days ago about the science that has piqued your interest, and I'd love to know what you've heard since that, you know, that has piqued your interest. Well, there's, let's take it in, in categories. Let's start with vaccines. There's been a, a lot of discussion about the future of vaccine research at this meeting. And um, in a really elegant talk yesterday by Glenda Gray of the MRC in South Africa and the HVTN, she laid out where we have been and where we are going um, in uh, getting us to an HIV vaccine and brought in some really important realistic issues that we are facing. The other beauty of that session is it was also then tied together with work on HIV cure. And Thomas Rasmussen from um, Denmark talked about the, the, the steps needed to get to an HIV cure. And the combination of the two talks really laid out a plan for both getting us to a safe, effective, and durable HIV vaccine, and also how these things can come, these two fields can come together and join forces and mutually reinforce to uh, get us closer to a cure. You also uh, were talking about some uh, research done around uptake and prep, how we can better be distributing it. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So we are, as a field, very frustrated by how poorly we have been able to meet the community's needs in terms of figuring out how to distribute PrEP. We have um, so many people will start PrEP and then stop and not restart. Uh, and to a certain extent, what we talked about earlier with Cab LA may help with some of, of that in the future. But really it's about having the, the ability to go to where people are, meet them at their, what they need, with the, their needs for testing and for PrEP availability. There was an example this morning in Thailand how they developed an evidence base that certain NGOs were better at distributing PrEP to certain populations, certain key populations, and then when the government made the choice to fund those centers, as opposed to the traditional centers, PrEP uptake was improved. We can learn a lot from that in the United States. There's also still the barrier of cost that we still have not settled, and we still need to do more as a country in the United States to make sure that PrEP is free and PrEP is available to all that would like it. I mean, that's what um, the Public Health um, Task Force, the Prevention Sciences Task Force has said. We really need to see that implemented at scale. And that's the value of the ACA still, is making prevention services that meet the, the standard essentially free. That's something we have to preserve as we go forward. You know, before we started this conversation on Facebook, you and I were talking about uh, the identification of a particular molecule and how that is going to inform research going forward. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So, on very early in the meeting, there was a presentation from a colleague from the NIH named Eli Borowitz, and he has spent 10 years looking at a very specific problem. You have a cell, that is identical to this cell, as far as we can tell, but this one has an integrated HIV provirus within it. What are the differences between these two resting cells? So, can you develop the tools and technologies, which took him 10 years to do, to be able to see what the differences are? And he can now clearly answer this question very simply. There are a series of approximately 40 plus genes that are expressed differentially in these two cells, which gives us a new roadmap, new pathways, new ways of looking at targets for cure. This, is, this may be the most important breakthrough of the meeting. We will not see the, the true impact of this for years to come as the research in this area. This is like a door opening into a whole new vista for cure research. It's very important and it's, you know, we will come back to this when we do Facebook Lives at future meetings, there'll be reports from on these gene families and we'll see this field grow. And that's one of the exciting things about being in research 
is you don't really know where the next breakthrough is going to come from, and it seems like such a surprise. But what has happened, it's 10 years worth of work. In some ways, that's what we had with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. We knew how to take the, the protein of, of this, the, the spike protein and put it in a shape that would stabilize it. And then that magically became the vaccines, but it didn't just happen overnight. There was a decade or more of work that led to that, that then we were able to make the Pfizer vaccine, the Janssen vaccine, the, the Moderna vaccine. So those kind of, you know, it's the, the little bricks that you build your wall with that gets you to the big building of your success. Yeah, you've already touched on a little bit of future work, but you said that word roadmap and, and unpredictability of science, and I'm going to ask you an unfair question. You know, when we meet again in two years at this conference, what do you think we'll be talking about when it comes to the science? I think in two years, we'll be talking a lot about how the U.S. government has responded with EHE. And we're at a, we're at a crossroads in the, in the United States where are we going to really commit to EHE? I mean, this is, under Harold Phillips, we're in such a good place right now in terms of things going forward. The leadership at CDC, HRSA, the NIH are all aligned, moving us forward. Can we really make the progress we need to make on ending the HIV epidemic in the United States? It's going to require us to address um, the PrEP implementation gap. Patrick Sullivan had a presentation earlier in this meeting that looked at the distribution of PrEP in the main populations, in um, whites, um, African Americans, and Latinos, and it isn't good for anybody, but it's particularly bad in the populations that need PrEP the most. So we're going to need, coming back to the theme of find the best way to meet the community where they live. If we can make the progress in that area of figuring out how we can make PrEP accessible and understandable to the community, the community, it, we don't reach, it is really on us, the, the scientists, clinicians, researchers, healthcare implementers, to be able to figure out how to engage these communities. It's not up to them to come to the clinic that's open nine to five downtown where they have to ride two buses to get to. We have to be able to go to the, the community, meet the community with people that the community trusts in order to meet uh, the challenges um, for EHE. Dr. Diefenbach, thank you for your time today and throughout the conference. It was a pleasure talking to you. Likewise.